Welcome back into the mental game where this week's guest is E! News Chief Correspondent Kelty Knight. I never was, I never wanted to die. I didn't want my life to be over, but I really, really needed a break. And in this episode, Kelty opens up about her amazing career as an entertainment reporter, interviewing the biggest stars in Hollywood, but she also talks about her personal battle with mental health and depression and even suicidal thoughts. She tells the story of being suicidal and wanting to crash her car into a parking garage. This was emotional. It was an amazing conversation, and I can't wait to share it with you. But if you know someone that is going through a difficult situation, sometimes just asking them how they're feeling can make a big, big difference. You know, sometimes life can be overwhelming. We all know this, and we have to help each other get through those tough moments. To learn more about how you can help someone in crisis, visit the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation website at ohiospf.com. Dot org, and we can help everyone with their mental health. But now it is time for the latest episode here on The Mental Game with Kelty Knight. Welcome back into the mental game. As you can see, I have a very special guest next to me, Kelty Knight, chief correspondent at E! News and podcast host on The Lady Gang. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the mental game. I am so excited about this. Honestly, I've been looking forward to it. So, All right. Well, thank you. We're, we're up early because this fits your schedule yes. best. I just flew into LA, so I'm still on that Cincinnati time zone, so I'm good to go. <laughs> okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect. No, I'm like, I have the most energy first thing in the morning, so I'm like, book me early, and then like I'll go do the rest of the day. So, All right, perfect. Well, hopefully your day's off to a good start yes. then with the mental game. Um, we're going to talk about your whole career journey, mental health. Uh, but first thing I ask everyone here on the mental game is what does mental health mean to them? And it's a unique answer for each person. Yeah. Um, whether it's something they discovered early on in their life, or maybe there was a traumatic incident that, that made them take better care of it. But I ask you the same thing. What does mental health mean to you? Well, it's so interesting, right? Like for me, the word that comes up is compassion, mm -hmm. which is so strange. We were, we were just literally driving down the street in Hollywood. We drove past a, a homeless fellow who was, you know, obviously struggling and it's so interesting because for me and what I've been through in my life, I think a lot of people still write, write off uh, people like that and mm -hmm. people that are struggling as just like the, ca the case is lost, yeah. you know, like lost cases, lost souls. And for me, like I've just learned to have so much compassion mm -hmm. for anyone struggling. And so um, growing up in a household, my brother's bipolar, um, growing up with a sibling who struggles with mental illness, you just learn so much that it it's so out of their control at yeah. times. And um, so for me, it's compassion. And then um, I think everyone can relate to this. Like when you are taking care of someone, mm -hmm. you kind of stop taking care of yourself. Yeah. So I say compassion and then I say balance. And mm -hmm. those two things have to be working in synergy at all times or else I'm thrown off. The life work balance or just balance in general is so, so big. I haven't heard the compassion piece. I've done about 40 episodes so far. Wow. So I like, I like that answer. Um, your career, like if you go on Wikipedia <laughs> or you go through your social media, yeah. you've done everything. Thank you. Um, I, and it's really, really aspiring and so cool to see you achieve everything that you've really put your mind to, it seems Thank like. You. I'm sure you still got some stuff on the bucket list. Yeah, the bucket list is getting emptier. And, <laughs> and it's kind of interesting that you say that. Like, I I think um, I grew up in a household where I didn't feel seen, and so I became this achiever. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be an honor student, the best at everything, because I thought if I was shiny and I was good, that then yeah. I would be loved. You know, it's like typical, like very, very A, yep. <laughs> very therapy-ish. But... um. And then in my 20s and 30s, like I just hustled so hard because I really believed that. I believed, I think, deep in my soul of soul that I was pretty worthless mm -hmm. and that if I could win an Emmy or I could get the TV job or I could be in a magazine, yeah. even if I was losing uh, Who Wore It Better, like yeah. I was still in the magazine, it was <laughs> right. my name, that like somehow I mattered and that I was important. And mm -hmm. then... At, in the last few years, I've really had this reckoning with being an overachiever and what yeah. that means because I got, I turned 40 and I was like, wait, 
I have uh, no social life. I'm a terrible aunt. I have no children. Um, I, I travel like once or twice a year with my husband and do a big vacation. But other than that, like worships in the night, like what is this all for? Like what, what am I doing? Like, Mm -hmm. is this a life? Am I going to be on my deathbed being like, I'm so glad I had six jobs and never slept at all times. Right. And, um, and so balance like is new to me. It's something that I'm learning. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm calling this, I hope you love this on the mental game. I'm calling this my soft era. So it's like, I'm like Taylor Swift. So it's like, I'm still working, but I'm just not so desperate for success. Like Mm. I have enough success. I've done enough things. Mm. If I never achieve anything else, I feel like I'm good, Yeah, you know, but if it comes to me, it comes to me. But if not, I'll take a walk. I'll read a book. Like I'm, I'm just trying to be more compassionate and softer to myself. It's like being comfortable, but still hungry at the same time. Like I'm hungry, but it's, it's like, and here's what's the wildest part about it is that I literally, um, I had just, I just finished wrapping up a show that I created super fan on CBS. And it was like a five year project. It took a lot out of me. Yeah. And when that wrapped, I was like, I need a break. I'm going to take a break. I just, I can't, be this like one woman show anymore. Like I'm exhausted. And, um, I was like, I'm just not going to try to get any more new work. I'm just going to do my job at E I'm going to do the podcast and I'm going to like live the soft life. I swear to God, I made that decision in my brain. And then all of these fabulous things just started coming my way when I wasn't like scrap clawing so badly for them. So I don't know what that means, but I'm following it. All right. Well, hopefully that energy still, uh, or can be to me too, yeah. because I'm gonna try, try to take that as well. Um, I love that your your career, like I said, is just it, it's so there's so many stops, and it was a journey from for you grew up in Canada, yes, and had that dream of getting to New York and, yeah. and you dance for the Rockettes. Yep. You did so much throughout your career in entertainment. You're chief correspondent at E News yep. now. It's just. What was the dream growing up? Was it always to just make it to New York and dance? Yeah. So, well, where I grew up in in Alberta, in Canada, you really had like two options. Girls, and this is like very 1980s sexist, but like for the most part, girls became dancers and boys played hockey. And that was like it. And I have a lot of friends from my area that went on to play in the NHL. Like it's a crazy hockey city, obviously. Edmonton Oilers, Wayne Gretzky. Um, And so for me, like I just remember my parents put me in dance and it was just... I wasn't really any good for a long time, like probably until I was like got into the end of high school. Um, But I always thought this is like my calling card. This is a way out. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I love, I love dancing, but I really love performing. Yeah. And so for me, that was just the way to, to take that step. And I was really lucky because I was growing up in my dance studio and a couple girls and guys had been able to take get jobs like they opened the world open they went to work in tokyo and they yeah. went to work on cruise ships and all of a sudden it was like wait i have a pass like i can, I can this. use this to get out of this small town where i never i always was the girl like i'm just that cringy person that always wanted to perform at the school assemblies you and, and always <laughs> always wanted to be like in the musical theater class always wanted to wear the most outrageous halloween costume like i just needed attention and i just was like I needed to live in New York City. Like that yeah. energy, that hustle, that like that was me. I'm not a small town gonna marry my high school sweetheart, have some kids kind of girl. Like it's yeah. just not who I am. I was born this way. Yeah. Um, and so for me it was just getting out and and getting to New York City was my dream. And then from there, when the dreams started coming true, like getting the rockets and you know, dancing and music videos and all this stuff, you kind of have to dream new dreams. Yeah. You're like, what do I wanna do now? What do I wanna do now? And eventually I got you know, elder as a dancer. And I was like, I was working so hard. I was the best at what I did. Like I was one of the top 20 girls in New York, you know? And like, I still couldn't afford to pay my rent because it's just such a shitty job. And I was like, what am I doing? Like I am the, if I was the doctor or a brain surgeon or a lawyer, I would be the best and be, have a like healthcare, you know? And I was like, I got to make a change. And that's when I came out to LA and transitioned into TV. Getting into TV, I've worked in it, not at the level that you have, but I've worked in, in local news and done some some things on big stages, whether it be the Super Bowl NCAA championships, yeah. and got to see how cool and awesome that job is. But it's just like dance. It's a grind. You got to work your ass off at it. You got to build your way up. Um, when did you realize that like entertainment reporting was going to be your job? I never was really trying. I had had, I mean, it was... 
I know I'm so elder, but it was like the early 2000s. I had a blog. I had a BuzzNet. I had a MySpace. Hey, I had uh, MySpace, just so you know. I'm, yeah, I'm, of course. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, you're youthful, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I had started making YouTube videos um, and these blog posts and putting them in my, you know, I don't remember, blog spot or whatever. And, um, and I met, I was at like a lunch or something and I met someone and she was like, oh, could you do what you do? Like TV shows did not have a digital counterpart. Right. There was no streaming. There was no like entertainment tonight has entertainment tonight online or TMZ. Like that didn't exist. It was, you were on TV or, and the internet was for like scene kids yeah. and nobody else like parent, you, there was no Instagram. There was barely Twitter, you know? So this executive was like, can you do the thing you do with the videos for us? And I was like, yeah, like at CBS. And then they were like, well, well, just make a show. And I was like, okay. And I, and so I picked music because I knew the music world a little bit because I had danced for right. all these musical artists. And I, I always, there's a little bit of every girl, I think growing up, you want to be like a VJ, like yeah. growing up as a child of the eighties and growing up in the nineties, you're like, I want to be an MTV VJ. Mm -hmm. That job didn't <laughs> exist by the time I made it to TV. But, um, so I just started running around town. I, I had a little handy cam and I would go in the LA weekly news. It was still a newspaper at that point. God, I am elder. Um, <laughs> and I would see who was playing concerts that week. Yeah. And then I would go to their website and I would email whatever contact information. I'd be like, oh, One Republic's playing the state fair. Can I come out and interview you for the insider.com? And they'd be like, sure. And I'd come with my handicap and be like, hey guys, blah, 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 blah. And then I would turn it on them. I'm like, these people probably were like, who is this girl? This is not a TV crew. Like it was so janky. Um, but I ended up doing like the first interviews in the U S with Imagine Dragons. They weren't even famous yet. Oh, like wow, I had them awesome. in my studio. I did that first U S interview with Ed Sheeran and oh, he literally wow. turned to his publicist and was like, am I famous here yet? Because he was huge in the UK and like had never done press in the States. Nobody knew who he was. So it was really, really cool to like cut my teeth on that. That is such a cool calling card to have. I mean, obviously you've interviewed everyone from Ariana Grande, yeah. Demi Lovato, but having the Ed Sheeran like first U.S. interview yes. was that kind of a pinch me moment when you're going through that grind. I guess at you didn't the really time, know it at the time, at the yeah. time, I didn't really think anything of it. Um, and then he kept inviting me back. Like every time he had something that he was doing, we would find a way for me to get in there, which was really cool. And I, I just remember, like he, I still have the picture of it, and I have it. He gave me his. His first single was called Lego House, mm -hmm. even before A Team. And I ha he gave me a little Lego, Superman Lego, at that interview. He was like, here, this is for you. He was like carrying them around. Oh, I still cool. have it. And wow. so like, um, I was that's just cool. at the Ed Sheeran show like a couple weeks ago and I brought it and I was like holding it up. And, um, and it's, just, it's just wild to watch these people grow and mm -hmm. change. And it can be hard too, because you're like, oh, I was like such a big part of your life and such a big part of your climb. And then you're like, can I come see you backstage? And they're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Great. Good job. Happy, yeah. <laughs> happy we made that happen for you. Yeah, like, good job. you know, and, and that, and that goes along with like what we were talking about the being important to people. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're an interviewer, you, you kind of feel like you're in the room with everyone important, but right. you're really not. You're on the other side of it, you yeah. know? And so once I got good with realizing that I like wasn't going to the party, I was standing outside the party, mm -hmm. like trying to yell at people and get them to interview with me and like realized that I didn't really matter and nothing I could do would get me into like into the cool kids club. Yeah. I was like, oh, well, I'm good. Now I'll just like try to be happy in my own life. Throughout this climb, because you get to Entertainment Tonight, started at yeah. Insider.com, and yeah. you have the the handy cam, like doing your own yeah. thing, selfie style, interviewing Ed Sheeran before anyone knew who he was, and you're getting to live out this dream that that really you created and paid for yourself, which is a really cool thing as me doing the mental exactly game by is. myself. Yeah. I, I kind of feel the same thing. Yeah. But throughout that climb, you had to struggle just with, with the grind of it, with yeah. the self-care, with, with anxiety. Did, did, what did you fight during those times? Well, I think imposter syndrome is the biggest thing. Um, so you just like look around and you're like, am I, am, I, is, am I good at this? Like I just hosted Miss USA two days ago or a couple days ago. And, um, and I got finished and I was like, oh my God, I'm scared to go on the internet because I don't want to read what everyone thinks about my face or that I know exactly the two things I screwed up when I was hosting. It's live. You can't yeah. do anything about it. Um, and so I just think like the imposter syndrome of, of, you know, 
feeling like you maybe don't deserve it. And then the, the pure exhaustion of, you know, this was a job when I was working. So the insider.com, I got promoted up to be a correspondent on a TV show called the insider, which is the sister show to entertainment tonight. It's now canceled, but, um, and because of the way the schedule was working, I was a correspondent. My call time at CBS would be 4.15 in the morning mm. for makeup. Or I'd leave my house at 4.15. My call time was 4.45. So I'd be in makeup at 4.45. We'd shoot the show at like 7 or 8 a.m. But then I would work all day, voiceovers, booking, yep. all that stuff. And then I would go on the red carpets at night. So when, you know, on Hollywood Boulevard, they would have the Disney carpet. And that would start at 8 o'clock by the time... Jennifer Lawrence showed up. It was 9.30. By the time I got home, it was 11. And then You're I was trying to be back up at 4. And I I did that for a couple years. And it it truly, really, truly almost killed me. Like, you need to sleep. People need to sleep. And there's a reason why when people are getting... I don't want them to be tortured. But, like, in, play, in places in the world, like, they withhold sleep from you. Because right. it's a form of torture. Yep. Um, and it just started making me so ill. I was so sick. I had a bunch of thyroid stuff, a lot of mental stuff. And, but, but you're sitting there and you're like, well, I can't complain because the minute I go to my boss or complain to everyone, they're going to think I'm not grateful for this opportunity. Yeah. I can't complain because like I'm getting the thing. I have the thing that every girl wants. I have the TV gig. Yep. So like, and then also you can't even really talk about it with your friends because Oh, poor me. I'm on, oh my God, you guys, I'm yeah. on TV every day and I have this great salary and like, it's so hard. Like nobody wants to hear you complain. Right. And so it just becomes this really difficult circle. Um, and man, oh man, it was tough. The, the ups and downs of the career in, in the spotlight, in TV, in entertainment, like I like I got a small dose of it with being a sports reporter and sure. everyone sees you on TV and you're smiling you're going through these amazing moments in your career but personally I was going through hell I had lost yeah. two family members in, a, uh, in three months yeah. when I thought I was gonna marry we had a toxic breakup going on and I was suicidal and it's just people can see so much from the outside you mentioned it like not being able to open up to your friends or maybe say it to them um how how long were you feeling depressed or, or, or going through maybe not really taking care of your mental health yeah. and how long did it take you to, to start really addressing it and taking care of yourself? Well, I had this breaking point. So I was in the midst of kind of that hustle and I can't even remember what red carpet, but they here in LA there, uh, in front of the ch famous Chinese theater, mm -hmm. uh, pre COVID, they used to shut that down a lot and have huge movie premieres. And when you do that mo movie premieres on that strip of road, they, they, you park your car at this thing called Hollywood and Highland. And it's like a six layer, huge parking structure that you can just r drive all the way down to the bottom level to find a, to find a spot. And I remember just feeling so exhausted and I had been going nonstop for weeks. Um, and then right after this, I was taking a red eye to fly to New Orleans to judge Miss USA. And I had my bags packed in my car and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this carpet. Then I'm going to go drive myself to the airport. Like it was just wild. And I got to a point where the stress for me turned me into what I would like call a toddler. Like I just, the, 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 what's like the string, like your amount of rope mm -hmm. was so short. Like I just couldn't handle any kind of adversity, anything changing, anything, whatever. And I, I think I got a call from a boss or a producer or something, and I had messed something up at some point. So I'm driving into Hollywood and Highland, and I just, I drove a mini white moon Mini Cooper at the time. And I remember I just had an absolute like panic attack, mental breakdown. Like I don't even know exactly what it was, but I'm driving around. And every time I got to the straight part of the parking lot, I gunned it like 60 miles an hour. And then right before I found the wall, I would put my brakes on and screech my brakes. Like I, I really was two seconds away from crashing my car into the wall on purpose. And I did it like all six layers. And later in therapy, my therapist was like, this is you trying to get off the treadmill. Like, it's so sad when you get to a point where you're working so hard. And I've heard this from many people mm -hmm. that like, you almost wish you would get, like, I wish I could go to the hospital for exhaustion. I wish something would happen to me so they would just put me away or put me in a hospital and someone would take care of me. Like, it's such a wild thing to say, but mm -hmm. I really, 
I really just needed a break. And I, you had mentioned that you had had uh, a moment of suicidal thoughts and like, I never was, I never wanted to die. I didn't want my life to be over, but I really, really needed a break. And so it was crazy. So I park my car. I go do the premiere. I'm like, okay, here we go. Like God. And so I go, I stand on the red carpet. Oh my God, you look great. Fabulous. What are you wearing? I go, I fly to New Orleans. I get to the hotel in New Orleans and I called my husband and I was like, babe, the weirdest thing just happened to me. I, um, God, I was like, I'm really tired. And I was in Hollywood Island and I kept trying to crash my car. Like something took over me. Like I wasn't, I wasn't myself. I wasn't in control. Mm -hmm. And, and he was like, yeah, well, okay. Um, I got off the phone, called a doctor. He was like, you need help and you, I'm worried about you. And so that was the breaking point for me because I hadn't been in therapy before. Okay. Um, and so that was a breaking point of me. I saw a psychiatrist, start, started on meds, like, and then really started figuring out how to change my life and mm. putting up some boundaries in my career. Um, but man, it was brutal. And again, it was so hard because I could never say to anyone, I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time because they would be like, Oh, you are. Mm, it must be so hard to be on TV. I felt very unseen. I had to suffer in silence for you. Did that one night, did it ever come back that feeling of, of, of not wanting to be here in that moment? Cause like you said, I don't, it, you didn't want to die, but you just didn't want to deal with, with life at the moment. And it's such a hard thing to figure out in your own mind. I have to imagine like that had to be just so like looking at yourself in the mirror when you get to new Orleans has to be one of the most surreal moments of your life. You're just like, well, and not only am I arriving in New Orleans, but I'm like at Miss USA, which is a beauty competition, and I'm putting on a fancy dress, and I'm getting my hair and makeup done, mm-hmm. and I'm like, and they're introducing me as like the judge from blah, blah, television, Kelsey, and everyone on that stage is looking at me like, oh, this really successful person who's like got it all and has it together is judging, like I was in no shape to judge anyone, but yeah. you just kind of show up, and so, you know, I, there have been times since where I have felt exhaustion. I have been really embarrassed for myself. Like I've done something or screwed something up where I was like, oh my God, I just like, I wanna, I always like joke that I'm like, I just wanna go like live in a hut somewhere. Cause Mm -hmm. it's like, I wanna be alive, but I wanna take the whole like public pressure and pressure from myself and career pressure off the table. Like I wanna just have like some baby goats and a book. And like, I think that would be good for me. Um, And there's definitely been times where I've been just like mortified. I screwed up, someone complained about me. I lost my job. I just like felt like an absolute loser, but never, I've never had another like mental break like that. That was like, it. I was out of control, wasn't in my brain. Like it wasn't Kelty. It was something else. Yeah. Were you able to like start going to therapy immediately after that? And how did that help you kind of get through that? Cause it's not like you can't wake up tomorrow and just be like completely fine with what just happened. Yeah. Well, for me, like I just shoved it under the rug because I was just like, oh, I'm just tired and I need to sleep. And maybe if I ate a vegetable, you know, the thing is I, and I feel like women do this a lot. Um, and we talk, I talk about it a lot on my podcast, lady gang, like, we just kind of get used to being uncomfortable and feeling like shit. Mm-hmm. So it's like, whether it's a health thing or it's a mental thing, you just kind of are like, oh, well, I got through it. I didn't crash my car into the wall. I'm fine now. Like, you know, you just you just go to the next thing. And so I did start seeing a psychiatrist at that time, um, got on some meds, which was amazing. But I, wa- I didn't go deep into like deep, deep, deep therapy until I lost my job in 2020. I left Entertainment Tonight and mm-hmm. I went to grief counseling because I was so sad about it because this is you know I'd worked at the insider and entertainment tonight for like over a decade yeah it was my best friend it was I was I knew every person there I knew their kids I knew their family members like I felt like it was like the worst breakup of my life that's when I went deep into therapy which is so funny breaking up with a career um and then have been going every week since so I'm like five years in was that like when did it start like the flip switch for you like this is good this helps me it's okay to open up to talk about this stuff because that is like something Mm -hmm. that I mean, you've seen over the last, I would say the last five years, especially with the pandemic, yeah. mental health, everyone had to go through something, feeling mm-hmm. alone, being at home by themselves. Uh, but like, you didn't talk about it at all growing up. No. I, did, I graduated college in 2015 and I didn't hear about it once in school. Never. Like, 
how did you start feeling comfortable doing that? You've been every week for five years. I mean, you yeah. bought in all the way. I bought in. Um, I bought in. So yeah, like, and, and isn't that wild? Like, it's it just is. when you stop and think about it, like I learned the Pythagorean theorem, which I've never used in my life, but like no one ever stopped to be, and we took like sex ed and health class, but like, were they just teaching us about vegetables the whole time? Like no one stopped to think and talk to kids about emotions and like regulation. And yeah. it's wild. To it me. is. We had a life skills class at high school. And oh my God. Did we you learn, would... learn how to tie a tie, balance a checkbook. I, I mean, I know how to tie a tie now, but like you Thank don't God. use a checkbook anymore. Yeah. yeah. Thank God we had that class, but we never yeah. talked about it. No, we never talked about it. And, and it, and again, it's like when you are a successful person, it's like you're not really allowed to talk about it. Right. It, and George Clooney famously said once, he's like, listen, I have shit in my life I want to complain about, but no one wants to hear George Clooney complain. And I was like, and I agree. Like, I don't, you are in Italy on the South, like whatever. Like I actually, you're right. Like nobody, but it's our responsibility to take care of us behind the scenes. So even mm -hmm. if I'm not outwardly complaining and letting people into the struggle, to have it behind the scenes and to, to be getting help is like so important. And I think the light switch happened a couple years in. I, um, I, I just realized I was, I, I was not as reactive as I once was. I was so reactive. I was so hot tempered. I was so like, this has to be done now, like very manic in a way. Yeah. Um, and once I started doing therapy and realizing there's other things to be alive for instead of just a job, um, and like that it could be part of my life to take care of myself. Like that yeah. could be another job. Like the job wasn't just outward things that made me sparkly to the mm -hmm. public. I could also do things for myself that actually just made me feel good. Like right. real dopamine, you know, yeah. as opposed to like the fake dopamine of social media or all those things. So once I flipped the switch on that, that's when I think everything changed and it's nothing it, everything's changed and nothing's changed. Yeah. I wake up and I'm like, am I trash? I'm horrible. I'm ugly. It's over. I'm in my forties. My career's ending. What am I going to do now? Uh, like I, every day, you know? And then, but at the same time I have those skills to be like, take a deep breath, Kelts. Right. You're doing fine. And you don't have to fear the future because I, my therapist always plays this game with me, like the, what happens then? So they're yeah, like, okay. you know, so they're like, it's very therapy one one So she's like, okay, so super fan is a hit show. What, what happens next? I'm like, we do another season. She's like, what happens then? I'm like, I'm very stressed out about it. She's like, okay, super fans, not a hit show. What happens then? I was like, I have three other jobs, a hit podcast and I work at E news. And she's like, okay, great. And then what, you know, like, yeah. and then what is like the most comforting thing? Cause I'm like, Oh, I do like, that. Yeah. like, Oh, like it's just going to keep going. Like it's just going to keep rolling and yeah. it'll be over when it's over. Well, it, the, the, then, then what, or what's yeah. next? Like, that's a great way to look at it because it's like, I don't know, whenever, whatever you do, whether you're, you know, working in a factory, you're a teacher, you work at a hospital, you're in entertainment, like no matter what you do in, in, in work, but also in life, like you can apply that to, okay, if this happens, it's like when I went through all my shit and I was suicidal for three months, I didn't think I was ever going to get out of, of this hole that I was in. I like, I didn't know what the answer to like mm -hmm. what's next was. I just thought I was always going to feel like this. And that's yeah. why I tell everybody with mental health, I tell them two things and I'm not a therapist, yeah. obviously, but I've been through like, you know, some really tough shit. One, do something. If, if you're having that moment in the car, like you were call, you know, call your Get husband, yeah. call a therapist, call somebody, mm -hmm. just do something. And two is that feelings are temporary mm -hmm. and it's so hard in those moments to like, you feel like it's everything. Yeah. You feel like you're never going to get out of, uh, of that depressed, sad feeling. But like, I promise, like, I mean, I was in that spot literally a year and a half ago and now I'm, I, I can't, I don't even recognize that yeah. person. Like, do you feel that way about you? you look back and you go, how was I ever feeling like this? I just can't imagine like letting myself ever get to a place where I was taking, where I, where I loved myself so little. Mm -hmm. Like I did not give a shit about Kelty as a human being. Like, and I was her. That's what's so sad is you're like, I can't believe I can treat myself so badly mentally, physically, just not eating right, not working out, not taking time for myself, not nourishing myself in any way, not seeking any help. Like I just did. I literally was treating her worse than yeah. I would treat any other human or animal on the planet. 
like I'm a vegetarian. I don't even eat meat. Like I've, I like love things and I was garbage human to myself. So it's, it's, it's really, really difficult. And I think the other turning point I had for me was, you know, my brother struggles with bipolar and it's, you know, also something that's in our family. We try to keep it pretty close to the vest, you know, Mm -hmm. um, he had, you know, COVID was really hard on a lot of people with any kind of mental illness. Whereas like, this is someone who is six foot tall, good looking. I had him years before, even though he does struggle with bipolar, he's been to LA. We've gone to Hollywood Boulevard. We went to Coachella to see Guns N' Roses. Like this is not someone who's not, not, has not overcome their demons. Like he is, when he's on the right meds, like you would never know. I remember being like so worried when I took him to Coachella and I was with, um, my friend Becca Tobin, who does Lady Gang and Leah Michelle actually. Mm -hmm. And we were together and they turned to me. They're like, what? I don't know what you're so worried about. There's nothing wrong with him. And I was like, Oh, nobody can tell. Like, you know what I mean? Cause he really had a handle on it. COVID was so difficult for people that have mental illness because all of a sudden, none of the doctors were available anymore. You couldn't see anyone, any therapists, any doctors in person. So my brother's meds stopped working but there was no one to look at him and be like, oh, you're having the shakes or your shifty eyes or yeah. you're not well because no one saw each, you saw each other maybe over Zoom and doctors yeah. were overwhelmed. And so he really had a fucking fall from grace, which got me to the point of I was in New York um, and he had had all these episodes and I was really worried. My parents were really worried. We'd called 911 like multiple times. I'm in New York City. Um, I was supposed to be at my friend's wedding and he called me, I called him and I was like, what is going on? And I was like, do I need to come? And he said, yes. Got on a plane. The next morning, got to his house in Edmonton and against his will, called 911, admitted him. We waited. I, he, I drugged him. I got him, finally got him after like 14 hours sitting, if ERs are the worst place on the yep. earth, um, especially for mental illness because mm-hmm. you're not dying you're not having a heart attack. Your leg's not cut off. Like yeah. if you're not dying, they'll let you sit there forever. So I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. This person is in mania and they are, this is not well, they're not well. And he has to sit there. Anyway, eventually I got him on a stretcher in the fucking hallway of the ER. And I had like hung up blankets from the ceiling to try to protect him because he's literally in bipolar mania with the sounds and the lights and the beeps and the yeah. fluorescent light and the door. So we drugged him. I drugged him like crazy. I was like, he needs more drugs. And so I didn't sleep for three days and 16 hours. I, st- I sat there and I watched him. And every time his eyes would flutter over, I would call the nurse and put more drugs on him because I knew that if he woke up, he would mania out and we would lose all the you know, time we had spent in the ER trying to get admitted to the psych ward. Mm-hmm. And there is, this is what is so fucked up and like why I wanted to come on your show is just like a plead to mental health facilities and doctors and everything like there has to be a different road in to mental health care than the ER because it's like when you show up at an ER it's like we had to stay there for three and a half days to they you can't just get into a psych ward you have to go through the ER you have to go you have this is the highway for this yeah and it's such a fucking horrible place for someone that's having mental any kind of mental situation whether they are suicidal or whatever and I watched people come and go and be like I want to kill myself and they were like well but you didn't so you could go home and you're just like what is happening like the way we care for people with mental illness anyway we did it we did get him in he got 24 7 care was there for a bunch of weeks I was editing Superfan, my show on CBS, from his kitchen table in Edmonton. Every day at four o'clock, would go over to the psych ward. I was the only person he wanted to see. I'd go up every day. That was like the biggest revelation of my life. And he's doing great now. Mm-hmm. But it's like when you spend a month and a half in a psych ward every day and you're watching the people in there and you're seeing the lack of control that people have over their own brains, it is like devastating traumatizing and also like the most that's where my compassion comes from yeah because i would meet all these people and i'd be like what are you in for and they're like i'm schizophrenic and they'd be like pa like <laughs> or they'd be like i'm here for the bipolar man and then like it was so crazy because i remember sitting with this guy my brother and this guy are sitting outside and we you know we would we'd be able to leave and like they could have a smoke break or whatever my brother doesn't smoke but yeah. you know just get some sun and and they looked at each other and like, what are you in for, man? I'm like, oh, bipolar, bipolar. And they're like, yeah, no, it's, it's good that we're here. But man, the highs are high, huh? 
And you're like, fuck, I've never heard someone like actually admit how much they like being bipolar because the yeah. mania is amazing, you yeah. know? Anyway, long story short, mental health sucks. Um, I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be compassionate. And like, I just, when I see people on the street or I see people struggling, I just like want to save them. Yeah. Well, thank you for opening up about your brother's story and things that you guys have experienced together because I'm trying to be like super, super educated before I speak on it entirely publicly. But like, I think anyone can agree that's worked in health and with insurance at all. Like that portion of it sucks too. It's fucking awful. And I've experienced that myself. Yeah. I've been sober now for, it'll be eight months this week. Yep. And like, but I switched insurances leaving my old job and I got denied for alcohol abuse. It's like, but I got sober and I checked in somewhere yeah. and, and like I made myself better. But now I'm like basically blacklisted is what my yeah. provider told me for 10 years with this big box carrier because it was, you know, in the underwriting. It's just right. crazy to me. But what you said about people getting the care they need and like getting in for me, I got lucky where I was already in therapy. So like my therapist is able, that's like kind of your, your, you have a champion. You have a champion. Yeah. Yeah. So they can recommend you and get you in. Right. And so that helps you in that situation. But it took me until, and you mentioned it before I started my, my first suicidal thought was when I was 14. Last one was when I was 28. So I didn't go to therapy until right. 28. Um, like that's, I'm bad at math. It's 14 years. years, but like it, if, if I'm patient zero and I'm yeah. not going to therapy till that long, yeah. think about how long it's taking everyone else that's dealing with their own depression, suicidal thoughts, bipolar, like disorder, like anything people are taking forever to ask for help. And so that's why talking about it and telling those stories, yeah. I think can help so many people out there. Um, and I also think men, like in general, women, you know, listen, we love rom-coms and we, we female friendships, in my opinion, we talk more about our feelings, you know, yeah. bros, bros out, bro out. And like, I see it with my husband all the time. Like he's tons of guy friends, but like they don't sit around and talk about their feelings the way that women do for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think it's embarrassing for men. It's very, uh, emasculating mm -hmm. to be like, Hey, I am really struggling and I have this thing and like, I'm an imperfect person. Um, and I don't know, I guess I, I love what you're doing here because it's like, you are this imperfect person, but you're also like, that's okay. But like, I'm also thriving. Like yeah. you, two things can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can have a past, you can, you can have a future that is a, a traumatic or struggle like it's it's this you yeah. know what I mean it's like you're in a really good place right now you'll probably be in a bad place again at some point yeah. like that's just life you know but knowing that and talking about it and people feeling less alone like that's the most important part of the puzzle have you noticed somebody in your life just not being themselves recently maybe you noticed they're more mad or sad or angry not hanging out with their friends or family as much that person might be struggling and going through a mental health crisis please, if you can, reach out and try to help them. And if you need help with how to help your friend or your family member going through a tough moment in their life, please use the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation to be a suicide prevention advocate. Visit ohiospf.org for all the tools, training, and resources you need to help that person you love. Look, you've listened to Kelty and I talk about it in this episode, but we all struggle in moments with depression, anxiety, and struggling with our mental health. We have to help each other get through those tough moments. So once again, if you wanna become a suicide prevention advocate or maybe need tools or resources for your own mental health, please visit the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation website at ohiospf.org. For me, it was just that alone feeling of like always wanting the, the, the marriage and the kids and, mm -hmm. and then like thinking the job was going to be perfect. And mm -hmm. it, it was pretty good. Like, and I love what I was doing, but it's just like you mentioned with your career, there's so many stress factors and you're doing so much all the time, no sleep. And I was a big drinker and I was going out, you get done with the show at midnight or you're mm -hmm. done with the game and you're out till three in the morning. Guess what? You have an interview at 9am. You got to be there hungover, drunk, right. no matter what yep. and figure it out. And so it just takes a toll on you. But for me, it was like the feeling of being alone is what is what hurt me and made me suicidal and depressed so much. What, like, what emotion do you think gave you that feeling when you were, you know, going Exhaustion. to crash your car? Yeah. yeah. Or when you were, you know, when you lost the job yeah. in 2020, I think just for me, it's like, <clears throat> uh, I'm very reactive to failure and not being everything to everyone. Yeah. So it's like, Failing at anything, having to admit that I wasn't the best, the prettiest, the most sought after, like having 
a place of work be like, you know what, we're going to go with this person that like yep. gutted me to my core. Mm-hmm. And I had worked so hard. I had tried so hard. I had been such a team player and like not without flaws for sure. Like I'm not yeah. a perfect person, you know, and I-, I had launched other things and was busy and I don't know, but man, just not being like number one mm-hmm. freaking killed me. And, um, and failing. And so I think that's what led me to like, you know, my incident at Hollywood and Highland is that I'm so afraid of failing. I had no boundaries. I couldn't say no to anyone. Mm -hmm. So it was like, Kelty, can you be there at 10 PM? Yes. Can you be there at 4 AM? Yes. Try to come in and be nice. You know, listen to everyone's stories, take in the energy of every single person, trying to hustle so hard, trying to make sure everyone has the birthday presents and the Christmas presents and their, you know, the mortgage is paid and like, it just, I could not fail. It was like, I, I did not want to fail. And I had too much on my plate. And so failing in any way is like such a trigger to me. I hate, I hate just sucking at things. And mm-hmm. so I'm very, I'm very strong and I'm super powerful and like I'm a go-getter, but I'm also really, really, really sensitive. So, you know. I'm sensitive too, which for men, not easy to admit, but yeah. like I've just, that's how I've been my whole life. And when I checked in, I was like, it was funny is after like two days, I wasn't opening up and the one of the so you basically it, in the one I went to in Cincinnati the mental health hospital you were in a, you have like psychiatrists and mm-hmm. therapists and you do individual things but a lot of the time you're in these group settings yes. classrooms yes. trying to figure out yeah. what's going on um, yeah and they're like well, Brandon why aren't you open up I'm like oh, I just don't like I don't really want to open up I just I'm always emotional I don't really I just been a bitch my whole life and yeah. she and she stopped me there the therapist did and she goes that's the problem. I'm like, I don't get it. She's like, that's the problem with mental health, but specifically men's mental health is like, you think you're weak if you're emotional or yeah. you're a bitch. And I'm like, I've never even thought about it that way. And yeah. then when I started this show or like started talking about my own mental health, I put out a letter on social media and that's kind of where the whole idea started. I started to hear from so many men, women talking about how the stigma around young men and men w- with not speaking up, like it was such a big thing. And so that's why it's cool for me. Like getting different guys like our friend yeah, Nate Burleson Nate, yeah. on or Ricky Williams or Ryan yeah. Shazier, or different people that look like these big, tough, badass men, but have also struggled. Yeah. yeah, struggled and gone through shit. Um, for you, like you mentioned having like all this pressure on yourself to you're worried about failing. Like I have that same thing. Like I just want to, mm-hmm. this has to get this many downloads. This mm-hmm. has to have this success. I have to get this guest. Like you put so much pressure on yourself. How are you able to like kind of, I don't think you can ever overcome that because you're a go-getter and you're this yeah. creative, like I must say creative wizard. I don't know why that came I to love my it. Mind. Yeah. I'll take it. Actually, yeah. quote unquote, creative wizard just got added to my website. Oh, all right. For well, you. That, hey. <laughs> perfect. We'll take it then. But how Thank do you. you like how do you balance that? Because we talked about balance the whole time. Yeah. Not like worrying about failure, but also like going after the yeah. successes. I have a skill for this. So this is something I learned from my co-host on Lady Gang, Becca Tobin. So I'm the same way. I'm a journaler and I keep like all the data. So I'm like month to month downloads and, you know, ad sales and merch sales and social media numbers and what, like, I just like, you know, and I want to grow. And like, if I, I will get so down, if like, say, you know, 40,000 less downloads month over to month, you know what I mean? I'm like, we're getting millions of downloads, like $40,000 is a drop in the bucket, but like, okay. And I just, I get so, and I'm like, guys, we got a market. We got a new marketing plan because (laughs) we're down in downloads and blah, blah, blah. And Becca's like, Kelty, could you quit all your jobs and just do a podcast? I'm like, yeah. She's like, are we healthy? Yeah. Do we like each other? Yeah. Are we, are we good? Like, so my, the thing that I learned from her is to zoom out. Mm. to zoom out. So I get so in the micro of like, oh, this post on Instagram didn't do well, or this downloads, or maybe the micro of like your job where you're like, oh, I got in trouble this day and blah, blah, blah. But then like, if you zoom out a year and you're like, what have I done this year? And you're like, oh, wow, I took that great trip and I read that great book. And, and overall, like, I think I've grown, like I'm doing pretty good. If you zoom out five years, you zoom out 10 girls, 10 years, 10 year ago, Kelty can't fucking believe what current Kelty (laughs) is doing, what her life is like, what her lifestyle is like, what her marriage is like, what her relationship with her family is like, like it's a different fucking life. So, you know, the zooming out of being Mm, like, like you may not be, 
you know, I, I see a lot of time in our, we have a Facebook group for Lady Gang. Like I see a lot of people being like, I really want this raise or like I'm in this unhealthy relationship. And you're like, those are the moments that are really hard and you feel like that's everything. But if you zoom out, it's like, yeah, so what? You got divorced last year. Like Kelsey Ballerini is someone who comes to mind. She's a great yeah. example of this. Like she's a country music star. We had her on Superfan. She had this really nasty public divorce and you're like, oh, that's all I'll ever be is this divorce. Mm -hmm. And then here we are two years later and she's, she's like the best time in her career, writing the best music, yeah. in love. Like, so it's like the zooming out of like, what have you actually accomplished over the last three years, five years, 10 years? And like, you're okay. Yep. Like, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And then one of my makeup artist friends, Afton, who does my makeup a lot, she'll come over and she'll be like, well, we're all going to die. Like, that's the other thing. <laughs> That's like she, the Ricky Gervais yeah, famous line. Like, well, we're all going to die soon. She, so. She's like, she's like, well, and I'll be like, I don't know. Like, do you think this eyeliner? And she's like, I mean, you look great, but like, we're all going to die. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it's those two things. I like to balance those two, two skills. I like the zooming out. That's definitely a tool that I'm going to use. Zooming out, looking at yourself. Uh, I think I'm going to try to quote you exactly. I wouldn't have fucking believed if you told me this yes. was a healthy 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are the most fun things you've got to do when you look back at, at everything that you've got? to? I, this is obviously heavy on mental health. I like to yeah. have fun, go through different fun memories with work and life. Do you have a favorite interview, favorite moment of your career so far? I think there's a couple. Like, obviously, the first time you interview Oprah is like a watershed moment. Yeah. Um, I covered the Met Gala for many years in New York, and that was always a day where I was like, I am at the like most glamorous Vogue magazine like situation. Right. Um, I think it's always been really meaningful when people really trust me with a hard story, you mm -hmm. know, a death, destruction, a divorce, something like that. Um, but I, I really have to be honest, like, a little bit of me is still a showgirl, like back dancer girl. And like, I really think of my career in terms of costumes. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Ooh, I, I remember I wore this really great dress to this event. And I'm like, Ooh, yeah, I, that was like the best part. So the glam and like the, the fun of it is, is really it. But the things I take away from my career are like the personal relationships, like getting yeah. to know people and having friendships in the business. Um, and I think the most rewarding thing actually never came from television and still doesn't. Um, working on our podcast, Lady Gang, like I, we created it ourselves. It's a very grassroots organization, even though it's still, you know, we've had a big success. We've had a TV show, clothing line, books, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but like every year we decide what we want to do for charity. And like last year we did this whole collaboration with this menstrual company. And basically for like every dollar spent on our website, we donated a menstrual cup to these women in need. And like, just knowing that like the stats on what that does to a community, a struggling community for women, like this year for back to school, we partnered with this, this brand and like sent new work bags, like backpacks yeah. to all the teachers in our community. Like it's That's stupid awesome. shit like that. But it's like, that to me is like legacy where I'm like, that's the stuff I like to focus on because it makes me feel better about myself. Like it's not so vapid of like, oh, yeah. I wore this dress and I got to be at this fancy party. Like all of that over time, it it just becomes blurry. And it's like, yeah. you think it's so big. I was at the Super Bowl for Katy Perry on the 50 yard line reporting and like that was amazing. But it's like, I'm really happy that I've been able to hopefully change a few people's lives. And mm -hmm. that is really, really, really meaningful. Um, and there's lots of fun too. I mean, there's lots of fun. I listen, I I've traveled around the world. I've been to like all these cool cities. Like I did Paris fashion week with Victoria Beckham. Like, I mean, it was just such cool stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I just, I'm the most, honestly, the proudest moment of my life. And the most fun moment is that this year is my parents' wedding anniversary. I sent them to Tahiti on oh, like wow. a big two week, all expenses paid trip. And like, being able to afford that and to be able to treat them to be like, Hey mom and dad who paid for all my dance costumes, yep. who worried about me when I was living in a hole in New York and not eat, like had no food and couldn't pay my rent. Like they've supported me so much and being able to like pay them back. I was like, Oh, and that is the difference between mm -hmm. 10 year ago, Kelty. Cause yeah. 10 year ago, Kelty was like the best highlight of my life is winning an Emmy award. And this current Kelty is like yep. the relationships what the meaning of my life is more important than the shiny shit. Purpose in life is something that like I've discovered in the last really year of um, like, I had no idea this is what I was going to be doing that I'd be sitting here next to you and all these other great, amazing guests that I have this week and that I've done since the show started. But it's like finding that purpose and realizing how like it's what you're 
meant to do, but also like that you can help people in the same breath. That's what's cool for me. Like I'm a huge Office fan, so getting to have I think Kate Flannery yeah. plays Meredith. She was like I love my third guest. Oh, cool! And so like for me, that was big and that was great in that moment. And yeah. then it still is like I love Kate. Yeah, she sees of course. This. Yes, She's still amazing. love you. Thank you for coming on the show. But seeing like the messages and the DMs, or like instead of people coming up to me when they see me at a game or at a bar, and they instead of like mentioning about an NFL play mm-hmm. or so- someone I interviewed, they go, "Hey, man, like." I was suicidal and I saw this interview with Kate Mm -hmm. or I was dealing with, you know, a family member that was struggling Mm -hmm. from bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. And I heard you and Kelty talking about Mm -hmm. it. Like it helped our family. That is what means the most to me now. And Mm -hmm. like, you have all these cool moments and like getting to meet different people is Mm -hmm. so cool, but making an impact and like it being true and genuine, I think that like holds the most, I don't know, my measuring stick of what I'm doing. Yeah. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. Um, for you, you just wrapped up super fan the first season of that. On CBS, you have Lady Gang. Yes, E. Chief, yeah. E, e. Like, how do you like? Do you have like things in that bucket list? That, I don't know why I'm reaching up to a mountain, but like, yeah. you had a bucket list here that you said you, there's fewer things in the bucket. Are there yeah. still things out there that, that you haven't done yet? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm I'm living my soft life right yes. now, so I'm I'm in a time of transition, and I'm just trying to figure out what that next thing could be or if I need a next thing. Like people are like, well, what do you want to do next? And I was like, I just want to keep doing this. Like I love podcasting. I love what we've built with Lady Gang. I love working at E! News. It's like the best. The clothes are so cute. The people I work with are amazing. Like, so I want to keep doing that. I'd probably like to do more live TV, like live red carpets if those yeah. still exist. We'll see what happens. <laughs> right. Um, but like I, I'm very content, which is wild which is a very weird I'm like this is a new new feeling (laughs) yes I'm like should I write another book and I'm like well I've published three books so I'm like I'm kind of done I'm like should I do a solo podcast and I was like I don't know but I already am on like the greatest podcast of all time so it's like I don't know I just I feel like I have the right amount of work and I have the right amount of free time to like just be a human being Mm -hmm. and that for the first time in my life soft life soft era comfortable yeah. compassionate software. I love it. By uh, the way, I still have like four jobs. Yeah, so it's, it's like, not it's like not that soft. Yeah. I'm not like slacking. Yeah. I just am like not trying to like change the way people watch television. Like I'm just going to do little goals. Yeah. Well, do you and, and yeah. make it the best that you can. Um, I do want to, because we were talking about it a little bit before off camera. And I think yeah. hopefully this still airs while this is yeah. still going on. Or we're in this era. Uh, I want to ask you about entertainment news if I can. Yeah, sure. So, I'm a big Cincinnati guy being from there, went to the University of Cincinnati. Travis Kelsey, he, uh, mm. he's making some headlines now. I've obviously known about him for a long time, yeah, but there's course. people in the entertainment world mm-hmm. that are learning about him now. But the Taylor Swift, uh, Travis Kelsey thing, have you ever seen anything like take over the internet like that that quick? Well, it's hilarious. I was hosting E! News the other night and I like literally was reporting on it and I just turned, I was like, E! isn't a sports channel now. Like, <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to, Listen, you can replay this if they ever break up. I'm going to just go out on a limb and tell you that I think this is her forever person. I wow. think that's why people are so obsessed with it is that I don't know that we've, we've, uh, listen, I don't know. I, I know Taylor a little bit, but like, I, I really, it's not my job to like comment on her personal life. But like when you're Taylor Swift, who do you date? Yeah. You know, who, who do you date? That's not like jealous of you in some weird way or intimidated by you it's like Beyonce has Jay-Z Taylor needs a star guy you know like when I saw him running out in the field and like everyone was I didn't really I don't know football very well but I was like oh he has like a big entrance I'm like they're playing the same arenas like this is an equal you know this is someone who's had to work so hard to get to where they are in their life and I feel like they're just so compatible um and listen they're playing into it and and Taylor it, don't forget Taylor has been reclusive for like six or seven years because she dated this guy, Joe Alwyn and they were never seen publicly. They never even, I think confirmed that they were dating. I mean, they were, they didn't walk red carpets together. Yeah. She didn't go to his, sh- like he wasn't, it was very private. So like it has been a while since we've seen the like public Taylor and yeah. I, I kind of love it for her. And I feel like it's okay to like, again, you do you. It's like, let the girl be excited. I call this the cocaine stage, which like, I know you're sober and probably shouldn't talk about this, but like, 
It's when fine. people are first falling in love, like when you first meet your person, I've been married like 10 years. So like I remember meeting and falling in love with my husband. It's not at all the same way. It very like different life now. But like yeah. when you first meet someone and you're just like obsessed with them and you're so excited and everything they do is amazing. I call it the cocaine stage where you're just like, it's cocaine. Like you're just like, everything's great. It's addicting. You just want to be around it all the time. Um, and and she's in the cocaine stage. So we let her live. All right. Yeah. Cocaine stage of uh, being love. in love with Travis Kelsey. Not. Yeah. But he's a good guy, I think. But he had like a shitty reality show too, right? Like to yeah, he is got, he a player? He got it was called Catching Kelsey, and I didn't watch it. Um, yeah. but I've seen clips, heard yeah. about it. Yeah, it was kind of like his version of The, the Bachelor. Bachelor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and he's had like I, I don't know his personal life too well. Yeah. But I know he's dated, dated around a couple, like had a couple serious girlfriends, one yeah. from the show, one after that, and then like the 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 Taylor thing was just so like genuine and funny like yeah because he's he was, like i wanted to go and i have a bracelet for her and yeah, then like and can't go backstage no and it's she like, doesn't have people backstage right and i'm like this is like one of the biggest stars in the nfl and he can't meet her that's kind of crazy and but, probably he's like so excited because like she is hard to meet yeah that's it, that's it, why i think they're equals i think it's gonna work out and for people that don't know he like i said he went to the university of cincinnati yeah. so people in cincinnati will freak out if they ever he like collects cincinnati clothing and like all the vintage stuff so if she's, but he doesn't play for Cincinnati. He, not he plays for Kansas City now in the NFL, but he played for Cincinnati in college. Got it. But if you wear, if you if Taylor ever shows up, if Taylor Swift is ever in anything Cincinnati, yeah. the internet in my hometown will break. <laughs> no, but she's a she's an Eagles fan. I know, but but which is funny. But then she was wearing the Chiefs stuff. Yes, and but Travis's brother plays for the Eagles, which is just crazy how oh, yeah. that all works. The podcasting game too has changed it where like Travis has his own podcast. Yes, so like, and it was so funny and he was like talking about it. I mean, I love but it. But respectful. Like yeah, that was great. It was by cool. Him. And and normally people are so like, I don't want to talk about it. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, he's like, I'm just gonna talk about it. Like I love that actually. Yeah, me too. Um all right. Anything else you want to hit on? No, with? I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for this amazing conversation and for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Last thing I ask everyone, it's the same advice to a young, aspiring mm -hmm. dancer or, or wannabe entertainment reporter. Yeah. What would you tell them? Oh my God. Thank you for asking. Get good at rejection. Um, the most powerful thing, like you think you have to be the best or you think you have to be super talented and that by being super talented or being great, that's what's going to set your career in motion but actually your strongest suit is just being really good at pe when people reject you because mm -hmm. you just have to keep putting yourself out there over and over and over and over again and if rejection knocks you to your core where you can't get up and do it again tomorrow yep. you'll never make it but being really good at rejection is like a superpower I agree and I've experienced that in this business as well thank you for not rejecting this interview yay <laughs> we, okay that was like yeah, tough was okay we got it alright Kelty Knight thank you so much for coming on the mental game we'll see everybody right back here Bye. next week and that was an amazing conversation with Kelty. I can't thank her enough for opening up with me about her mental health journey, especially battling those suicidal thoughts. You know, I've been there and I know it's so hard to talk about, but I know her story will help a lot of you listening at home to the mental game. Next week, it is another surprise guest and it is my biggest guest ever here on the mental game. I will give you one hint. It is one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. I am so excited for this interview. It's definitely the biggest episode of my life here on The Mental Game, and I can't wait to share this amazing, emotional, and inspiring conversation with all of you next week right back here on The Mental Game.